Welcome to Research Perch from the Massage Therapy Foundation. Short, practical insights into massage therapy research and how it can benefit your practice. Hi, and welcome to Research Perch, your podcast about the best in massage therapy research with your hosts, Ruth Werner and Dr. Geraldine Cameron, president of the Massage Therapy Foundation. We're so happy. Hi, Geraldine. <laughs> Hi, Ruth. Coming from steamy Chicagoland. Yep. Um, and I'm coming from the cool and clammy Oregon coast, and we're happy to be here today uh, to talk about a case report that recently appeared in the International Journal of Therapeutic Massage and Body Work. That is the publication of the Massage Therapy Foundation. Um, and this is a really, this is a, a case report that has a lot going on in it. And I think it's going to be very important for our profession for a, a couple of really interesting reasons. So the um, title of our case report today is Dynamic Angular Petrissage as Treatment for Axillary Web Syndrome Occurring After Surgery for Breast Cancer, colon, a case report. And the main author is Paul Lewis. Uh, and he was helped by a researcher, Dr. Joan Cunningham. Um, and uh, so this is a case report, which is, um, uh, we'll talk more about what that is in a minute. Probably most of our listeners are already familiar with this concept because we talk a lot of, about a lot of case reports on Research Perch. Um, but basically the, the brief overview is um, there was a client who had had um, a recent breast cancer surgery and who developed a condition called axillary web syndrome, which is a situation where, um, for reasons that are not entirely clear, there's a development of cord-like extenses, extensions of fascial thickenings that run from the axilla, and in her case, all the way down to her wrist and she found it very painful to, it limited her range of motion it uh, particularly around her elbow and her wrist and it was very very troublesome and um, her typical physical therapy did not help uh, and so she consulted this massage therapist who had developed a protocol that he thought might be really useful for this um, and um, and he wrote down what happened. This is um, actually a little bit of, a, of an unusual case report for us. We usually get prospective case reports, which means people sort of agree ahead of time that they're gonna write a report together and work on it together. Um, and this one was a retrospective case report where the therapist felt his results were so uh, interesting that he wanted to share with them, even though it was after the uh, the treatments had concluded, but he still got all the appropriate permissions and, and good documentation from his clients. And there's a lot of really cool things to learn for this that we're very excited to share with you. So, um, so Gerilyn, would you like then to talk to us a little bit about where case reports fit and their strengths and weaknesses and um, tell us about, you know, set this in context for us? Um, sure, I'd love to. Case reports are the weakest study design that's out there. In fact, they're not even considered research. That doesn't mean that they're worthless. They're very beneficial to the um, profession in that they are a, a, a report of what happens in clinical practice. And so sometimes people who are in clinical practice think, well, researchers don't really understand what we do out here and, and they are doing these clinical trials that really have nothing to do or the treatment protocols have nothing to do with what we do in practice. Well, case reports are a good way to inform researchers as to how do you actually practice. And so case reports are considered the lowest level of evidence in our hierarchy of evidence. But you know, when we look at the pyramid, they're very they're at the bottom, but they're very broad, they're very wide. And so trying to to um, really share the information that happens in clinical practice is very important in order for researchers to then kind of build up that uh, pyramid of hierarchy of evidence. And so case reports are great. There's a uh, new criteria for writing case reports uh, based on what's called the CARE guidelines, C-A-R-E. And those guidelines tell a person who's in practice here are all of the different factors that you need to include in a case report in order for it to be the strongest case report you possibly can write. And those case report uh, care guidelines have been modified. Uh, oh, hi, Woody. <laughs> um, Sorry. Okay. 
the, but we're gonna we're, i've got my assistant controlling this right now. <laughs> he likes the care guidelines too that's great so yes. there are um there's an article written uh, by Nikki Monk and Karen Boulanger that have modified the care guidelines specific for massage therapists, which you can find at IJTMB.org. So if you're thinking about writing a case report, I strongly encourage you to read the care guidelines and also read the modifications to the care guidelines for massage therapy. Right. Well, and as we'll see, what the care guidelines do is <coughs> they create a sort of a level playing field. So everybody's reporting the same information, which makes it much, much more useful when we're trying to aggregate it to get a bigger picture. The, um, the other thing that I, that I like to emphasize about case reports is that they're not experiments, they're observations. Um, and in addition to helping researchers understand what massage therapists do, case reports also help other medical professionals understand what massage therapists do. Um, and so it's really, it's a sort of a snapshot into our session room uh, in a way that we can share with our cohorts. And it's, uh, and for that reason, again, they're, they're super important, even though they're not considered experimental science. They shouldn't be. We're not doing, you know, human experimentation here. So, um, so I've already given a brief introduction to the sort of the outline of this paper. Um, my, uh, what I want to do at this moment is sort of talk about the research question and its importance. So the research question here basically is, will this technique, which the author has called dynamic angular petrissage, it's a technique that he um, sort of honed in on and developed out of his experience, will this technique help a person who has this condition, axillary web syndrome? And um, uh, he, um, and, he, and he went about this in a very lovely methodical way that I'll let um, Geraldine sort of walk us through a little bit. But, you know, he begins with the point that axillary web syndrome is a quite a common and, and quite serious complication of uh, uh, breast cancer surgeries. And um, it's not well understood. It's thought to be angiolymphatic and fibrotic in origin with lymphatic and fibroblastic involvement. The cord may be exacerbated by tightness of surrounding tissues. This is again, this has been extremely well referenced and well researched. He's, he's really done a, a great job of pulling together a lot of information to inform his paper here. Um, uh, axillary web syndrome is considered by some to be self-limiting, which is to say for some people, it seems to just go away after a while, but a lot of people really contest that. And, and what may happen is that it may be less painful or less restrictive, but it may not fully resolve. And obviously it would be a better outcome for people who have gone through this challenge to have full range of motion and pain-free range of motion of their upper extremity. So that was his approach is, you know, what can this technique do with axillary web syndrome? And another thing I'll say before we, before we launch into the, um, the minutiae of this report is, is I really loved his approach to working with this client and her fascial restriction because he was very specifically, and he said this in a couple of places, not about making anything rupture. He was not about breaking anything down. It was about there and uh, that's compared to other approaches of syndrome and um and uh it certainly paid off um for this client so Geraldine, do you want to talk us a little bit through the methods and the presentation and I, I would also like to say that this would be a really great report for anyone who's listening to this to maybe, you know, have this open, have this with you while you listen to this podcast, because this is such a beautifully presented report um, using the care guidelines. It's super easy to follow. It just creates a really nice model for what case reports can be. Okay, go ahead. All right. <laughs> I agree. I thought this was a really well-written article, and I was interested because especially because I had not ever seen axillary web syndrome and the pictures that he included were phenomenal. They really helped explain and, and just show me what this looks like because you can actually visualize it. 
I also had not heard of this form of treatment. And so going through, you know, trying to understand how is this treatment different than other forms of massage, uh, it was really beneficial that he had a table, table two, um, that, was that the table? No. Hang on a minute. Table three. Table one is the timeline. Table two yeah. is the summary of assessments. So table three was the schedule of treatment components and really walked us through as to what exactly was the treatment that was administered to this uh, client. There were only two different treatment sessions, which pretty much fully resolved the, the client from any pain. I know it was, it was, I didn't expect that. Um, I thought, well, maybe that brought her back to feeling somewhat normal and then she just went about, about her way. But with this, she really did fully resolve and the cord-like uh, issue that she had was resolved. So he did a great job at discussing, um, you know, when was treatment administered, exactly what was the treatment that was administered, what got better. It was the pain and the range of motion were the two different uh, main things that they were looking at and, and wanting to uh, fix as well as the actual visual visualization of this cord like structure. So he did a, a wonderful job with this with the, uh, like I said, the pictures of what it looked like um, were great. I wanted pictures of the treatment because yeah. to me, that's, that helps me a lot in order to better understand, you know, what did this therapist do uh, for treating. And I realized that with massage, you can't have a picture of every single setup for, you know, all the different components. But I was very interested in seeing how is this different than other forms of care. So I did not get that in this case report. Right. So I'll add to that, that one of the things he did um, that I thought was most, that, that made such a strong argument was he did a long-term follow-up. Right, so he had, you know, only two sessions, <coughs> pardon me, only two sessions with this client, um, but something like 14 weeks after his second session with her, he had a follow-up time without a treatment session, but to um, talk with her about her restriction, to take pictures, to, you know, see how things were going and found that there was, you know, long lasting changes. This wasn't a temporary resolution. Um, uh, so this is something Gerilyn and I were talking about before we began this broadcast is something that is um, that I think is worth talking about for a minute, which is that, so here's a therapist, Paul Lewis, who developed this protocol that he calls dynamic angular petrosage, although he says there are non petrosage components in it. And I actually have met Mr. Lewis and he's done this a little bit on me and it's then it's very as he said, it's dynamic. There's a lot of movement. There's a lot of rhythm. There's a lot of um, uh, stretching of tissues. Um, and, uh, and, and it's always a tricky thing when people have developed a protocol and that, that they feel gets really good results. Um, you know, when people come to us and they say, I have this fantastic thing and I get these fantastic results with carpal tunnel syndrome or with frozen shoulder or with knee pain, you know, really the only thing we can say um, on behalf of the foundation is, isn't that wonderful? Please write a case report so that people can learn about it. Um, and, and here's a guy who, who did it. You know, he took up that challenge and he wrote a case report um, based on this experience with this um, client and he got a tremendous result. Um, and, uh, uh, and, and that takes a lot of guts. And so one of the questions or one of the, one of the interesting things about this then is, so he's, he, you know, he's developed this protocol. Is it anything new? Really probably not. And he's got a, a, a pretty detailed description of what he's doing. He's not trying to keep anything secret or he's not trying to like, you know, trademark his special Lewising technique. Um, but I don't know that, you know, one of maybe one of the weaknesses of this report is that it might be difficult to re to 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 um, repeat because I, you know, from reading this, I could take a stab at trying to figure out what dynamic angular petrosage looks like, but I'm not sure I'd be able to really rep replicate it. Um, that's, you know, that's because he's he's done something a little novel. 
Um, but he's been willing to look at it under a microscope, which I, which I think is um, a great example for anyone listening to this. If you have a technique or a protocol or an approach to a problem that you've seen get re really great results, here is a model to follow for how to actually test that out. Um, and I, you know, I'm really hoping that this might stimulate, might, might trigger people to, to do that. I've seen some case reports in other professions where they have a video link so that oh, cool. uh, it's not just a description. It's also an actual visualization, especially for new techniques, because it's, it really, it's hard for readers to understand, well, what is gentle adaptive muscle stripping or gentle adaptive dynamic myofascial release. How is that different than myofascial release or muscle stripping? What does gentle adaptive mean? And so I would really like to see a video of this. I, I'm not questioning if it's different. I'm questioning how is it different? And right. you know, I, I guess I'm, I'm really, I'm curious to know how is this treatment different? And if I can't tell just from reading it, then, you know, I can't treat clients using this um, and other right. therapists can't treat clients using this. It's not um, able to be utilized in the future. And so I think it's really important to be able to see what exactly is it that happens during this treatment that got this woman so much better. Well, and, you know, I, I think also for people who have clients who might benefit from this type of work, it might be time to look for a workshop with this, with this uh, researcher. Cause I know that he, I know that he also teaches. Um, so uh, that's awesome. I think that's really great. You know, I mean, this is how our profession expands. So um, just going back to our sort of general outline, we've talked a little bit about strengths and weaknesses. I think the idea of doing, of incorporating video into a case report is a brilliant one. And I wonder if at the IJTMB if we have the capacity to do that. It seems like we would since it's an all electronic journal. Yeah, and if, um, if we don't, my suggestion is that uh, people can create their own video and uh, put it on a YouTube channel and mm -hmm. then include that link within the article because the articles are online and people can click on it uh, in order to just link out into the, the YouTube video. So right. yeah, I think that would be really beneficial. You know, one of the other things that he did that I really enjoy is he had a lot of qualitative information in this, meaning he had quotes directly from the client. And, you know, hearing it in a client's own words is very meaningful. So it's not just like a, a visual analog scale or an Oswestry, you know, just a score. It's their own words and how did they feel. And so that's something else that can really get incorporated into case reports that are very, very beneficial that can't get incorporated into other study designs. Right. Yeah. And that becomes a very, that's such a powerful story to tell when you're working with clients, when you're working with their healthcare team, you know, about about what might be effective to help people deal with these challenges. Right. So, um so this was a case report specifically about this condition, this, con this, this sort of fascial constriction called axillary web syndrome. If we think about application for practice, um, you know, really what does this mean? It means uh, if you have clients who are dealing with this condition, here is a technique or a protocol you might wanna find some more information about. Um, I'm kind of curious about whether this could be applied in other fascial restrictions, which I think is actually how it was originally developed, is to look at things like burn scars or post other kinds of post-surgical scarring. Mm -hmm. um, and many of us have clients who are who struggle with loss of range of motion and and you know the painful aftermath of of scar tissue. Um, and so here's you know this could provide some more tools to help uh, to help clients who live with these challenges. Um, and so, hang on just a minute. I want to just check where I am with my thing. So um, in terms of, of talking about this, um, you know, among your, our, our listeners' communities, cohorts, and um, uh, journal clubs or classrooms, you know, we thought about a few questions to ask. Um, and one of the questions that we thought you might be interested as a just sort of a launching off place for a discussion is, is um, 
you know, this report does something important, which is it demonstrates how a person who has developed an, a, a routine or a protocol can test it in a rigorous way. Are there things here you felt were missing from how he tested it? And how would you test your favorite approach to a common problem? Um, another question that we had um, specifically for the specialty of oncology massage is what cautions or concerns might you have for this protocol with other cancer patients? For instance, one of the things he was quite cautious about and, and did some follow-up questioning about was um, the risk of uh, um, stimulating or triggering a lymphedema episode. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, you know, this is something that would have to be very, really carefully dealt with by someone with some expertise um, about this possible complication. So what cautions or concerns would you have for this protocol with other cancer patients? This report looks at this technique called dynamic angular petrosage for axillary web syndrome. Are there other conditions where you think it might be useful? Does this stimulate your thinking about your client with knee surgery or anything like that? Um, and then lastly, what other questions do you have about this report or this technique? Um, one of my questions was, um, you know, this was a woman with a, with a pretty recent surgery. I'm wondering if someone who'd been living with axillary web syndrome for 10 years um, might have, you know, what her prognosis might be in looking at using this technique. So. Yeah, I really, I like, I like those questions. I think that um, when we read these articles, it's, at least to me, it's more useful to talk with other people about their thoughts about it because I may have missed things uh, they may have missed things and, you know, talking about it together really helps. And so doing this in a book club sort of fashion called a journal club is a great way to have these types of conversations where everybody reads the same article and then just have a conversation about it like Ruth and I are doing. Um, and it's also great for the classroom. And so if you're a teacher, this might be something that's worthwhile to talk to your classroom about. Uh, this case report was a silver winner in the Massage Therapy Foundation case report contest. So I encourage you to take a look at massagetherapyfoundation.org's website about the case report contest if you're at all interested in submitting a case report uh, for that contest. Awesome. And where, where, where could a person find this article again? IJTMB.org. The International Journal of Therapeutic Massage and Bodywork. So that's great. Hey, Gerilyn, thanks for spending some time with me to talk about this um, case report, Dynamic Angular Petrosage as Treatment for Axillary Web Syndrome Occurring After Surgery for Breast Cancer. It's always fun to um, chat with you about this stuff. Thank you, Ruth. And we'll see you all next time. Bye. Bye. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Research Perch. Please send feedback or questions to perch at massagetherapyfoundation.org. See you next time.